everyone and welcome to today's Marketing Level's Thought Leader interview. My name is Harshit and I'm the Director of Business Alliance of two brilliant marketing SaaS tools, RankWatch and WebSignals. And my today's special guest is highly experienced sales and marketing consultant, a HubSpot Diamond Partner, founder and director of Sydney-based agency called Lupo Digital, Glenn Miller. A big welcome to you, buddy. I'm so happy to host you today. Thank you very much, Josh. It's a pleasure to be here. Looking forward to our time together. Thank you so much, Glenn. Let's talk a bit more about your journey. How's your life and how are you like as a child and how you got to where you are today? Fantastic. Uh, so, wow, it's a, it's a dangerous question you're asking, Josh, about my childhood. But no, look, I come from a close family. The ethics and the morals shine through into the business we run today from a culture code point of view. The brother of three parents grew up in South Africa, immigrated to Australia in my early 20s at 21. Studied in Australia, finished my studies, went into work actually in the diamond and jewelry industry, moved through all facets of business, finance, marketing, ended up in marketing and sales, uh, and then wanted to just go out alone and get a bit of experience. And I actually wasn't sure where to end up. I left the family business and I got involved in window furnishing. It was an offline business selling yeah. window furnishings, you know, blinds, curtains, shutters, awnings. Uh, to, it was another family business, unfortunately, which often happens, especially in our trade. A lot of people just start up learning, self-learning. And a long short, I dabbled in Facebook ads, was starting, social had just begun. Zuckerberg's movie was all over the web. Um, you know, the web was slow in those days. Um, web development and CMS platforms were, were just brand new. You know, Cold Fusion was the, was the backbone. And didn't have Shopify and e-commerce platforms just yet. So the long and the short is I kind of started just doing work in email marketing. MailChimp was, you know, the new kid on the block. And I kind of, I'm, my role is director of growth strategy now and customer experience. But if I go back, you know, those years ago, we, I started seeing a vision of how the digital landscape all connects. But I then yeah. um, was approached by somebody to join them in a web development firm. And kind of the trend, I'm, I'm probably going back now about 12 years ago, the trend was to try and offshore out of Australia to get the production you know, global. And so at the peak of that business, we were a small business. We had about six teams of four people in a team, front end, back end, developer, account manager, project manager. And really Australia was a sales arm, just growing website development, which didn't make much money. In those days, people were using Wix. It had just launched. It was like the first one, uh, uh, CMS. And it was just very difficult to monetize. And then Google ads were starting. We got involved as a Google partner. Um, and again, people just expected that to all be free. You know, I can log in and create an account. Businesses didn't want to pay. So I think for those listening, it's probably a similar story. But fast forward the last five years, you know, HubSpot for us, for me, I followed their journey back to when they started with marketing tools. Yeah. And it was kind of the gold standard. I think both from a culture code as well as a best practice, a kind of setting the tone for the industry. Maybe it was that futuristic stuff that most sites couldn't do following people around the web. But the truth is, our, in those days, the pricing structure was very different. And our clients, um, when I was, again, invited to join my partner and found Lupo Digital, we kind of pitched the business at, a, you know, in America, it would be a, a micro business, but kind of in Australia, medium to larger size business, not quite corporate um, and not quite enterprise, but and not small business, but everything in the middle. And that's become our sweet spot. And that's what we love. And that's kind of, yeah, that's my history. That's where it's all come from. I think Glenn, like a majority of, it's a sweet spot, like, you know, that medium level, because I think the need for CRM and automation comes once you have traffic on your website, right? You have a decent size business. A lot of businesses now I've seen like started adapting it at a very entry level, which also makes sense. Because you build much more better system with time. But yeah, I mean, I completely get the target audience that you have. Let's talk a bit more about the service offerings that uh, your agency have. Please share a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Lupo Digital, we've kind of got two arms. One is quite a consulting arm that kind of handles the strategy and strategic advice. And the other arm is, is agency side, production side, campaign side. So clients either arrive with pain points and problems they just need solved, oftentimes technical. And, you know, we took a view to back HubSpot quite a you know, When we started the business, we said we're going to become a HubSpot company in terms of the clients we serve. So some businesses will come onto HubSpot, some are on HubSpot and need our help. But in all cases, we're the badge kind of first. And what that means is we either have businesses that need help. So, so products we offer are helping businesses onboard with HubSpot, HubSpot training, 
I'm a HubSpot professor, so I'm a, I'm a certified HubSpot trainer. Um, so we get a lot of business to help businesses train their team and staff very quickly. So we've got a suite of HubSpot products, everything from website development, integrations, SEO, paid media, onboarding, training, that are purists to get a business up and running on HubSpot because some of the businesses have teams and those teams, um, they have the hands, they have the resources, they just don't have the HubSpot knowledge or they don't have the infrastructure rock solid. And so one of yeah. our products is everything HubSpot. And then once that's done, the other product is all around campaign production in the HubSpot ecosystem. And again, right. that can include everything. You know, we do full multi-channel campaigns and the strategy behind that, the inbound nature of that strategy, the HubSpot nature of that strategy is another, so it's almost productized, but it's abstract. When you say to people strategy, we all sometimes see different things. So I guess in simple terms, our wheelhouse is the HubSpot product and then campaigns in HubSpot. And if a business, you know, is, I suppose for those that don't know, um, you know, the marketing tools of HubSpot include blog, social, website, email marketing, workflows, all of the marketing tools. Um, we've also just started productizing what we call a sales operating system. So HubSpot has a sales suite with templates, a lot of process based, um, and even how we operate as humans, you know, task tools, a lot of sales functionality that business, it's just a lot of ammo in the HubSpot platform that businesses don't know how to unpack, building playbooks, that kind of thing. So we also help businesses get a consistent approach to selling through the HubSpot sales suite. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's a lot in there. And I suppose therein lies sometimes our difficulty that we, on a conversation like this, it can feel like we're one size fits all, we're everything to everyone. But what we do is we help businesses scale back. You know, at the end of the day, we want to represent businesses that are growing. They're on HubSpot. And it's our job just to help them find out like, where's the critical pain point? What's the immediate need? And based on all those offerings I've mentioned, we'll then kind of adapt with them one step at a time to help them understand like, you know, what's the critical win we need to deliver first and the rest generally folds out from there. Gotcha, gotcha. Clint, how's the typical client journey in your organization? Uh, what those first 30 days look like for a client? Yeah, awesome. So look, I think, I think what you're asking, and we kind of break down into pre-sale, um, mm -hmm. but what you're asking is probably from the onboarding stage. So okay. I think we've, we've also worked out that as we're growing, we're getting more systemized, more methodical. So once our sales team onboard a client, um, they go through pretty rigorous process to things like a kickoff call with the client. Uh, we've got templates and documents that then, you know, just additional to absorbing the initial brief from our sales team, once you've had that kickoff, sometimes you find that what the client thought the pain points were is now changed 360. So they had an issue with forms on their website, but now they've actually realized they're spending money on paid media. So can we pivot? And so, you know, things like scope creep and that we've, we've built a system that allows us to prevent that. Um, but at the same time, that first 30 days is all about probably two weeks or so, just getting their HubSpot house in order. That process allows us to identify quick wins. And we'll then implement those quick wins probably in the second two weeks, you know, so within the first month, they're seeing some results. And depending on what we're doing for them across our product offering, sometimes that's all we've done. Sometimes they want to bolt on training, even sales support with their sales team, um, start getting into how to use the CRM better, customizing fields. So we try to deliver quick wins straight away. And then typically with clients that are, you know, in the old days, we used to use the word retainer. Um, but, and I think everyone loves the word retainer. But for us, it's more about success. You know, if we're doing our job well, clients will keep us. And obviously we want the long-term. And if we're not, we're happy to put our hands up and walk away. So extending beyond that month takes on different shape depending on what we're doing. But if it's a full marketing um, support, then we, we kind of strategically spend some time, you know, mapping out. Generally, we'll recommend like we want to go to market with one campaign for that business around one of their products. You know, what's the 80-20? Where's their sales coming from? And how do we clean that up? optimize it, uh, sometimes just launch it. Um, so it can look very different for different businesses. For some businesses, they just want to do a referral campaign, lead nurturing, using the automation. They've never done it before. You can imagine if things are cleaning up databases, getting your hands on the right content. So just depending on whether we, we're kind of going to market for lead generation, that's a different style campaign to whether we're doing a lead nurture campaign. And then the runway to how we implement those is very different. So if it's a business that needs a full channel and needs socials and blogs to drive traffic, paid media, we'll focus on the landing page. Like where's this traffic coming? And is it designed to convert? And is it to best practice that we might inherit the client's assets and fix them, or we might develop them from scratch. 
And I suppose being HubSpot, the, the, the whole inbound nature of what we do, that takes a different shape. You know, is it a top, middle, bottom of the funnel approach? Are we looking at, it, at building a new asset? You know, the shiny toy that's going to encourage leads and clicks, or is it just straight into nurturing? But generally it's it's between, you know, I'd say we look at sprints. We don't implement the agile methodology, but we generally run campaigns on purpose. And so it can be everywhere from a small campaign with just email marketing and some socials over a two to four week period to full Monty, you know, full campaign launched within three months. And then we're moving into measurement and goal measurement reporting. And then we kind of repeat that across a variety of campaigns. And like I said, we, we're always looking for a long-term client where it's continual work for a couple of years to come, I hope. Glenn, just curious because uh, we're a HubSpot diamond partner and uh, HubSpot is mainly about inbound marketing. Is there any outbound uh, strategies that your agency practice and uh, for your clients? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, look, I think at the core of HubSpot is really the tracking team. So we have clients that are running radio adverts or, or more today with COVID around the world using QR codes. Um, we have clients that have billboard ads, you know, outside properties, finance billboards. So I think uh, we love kind of that challenge and QR codes has made it much easier where we kind of need to absorb a campaign that's running offline and find a way to track it and bring measurability in through HubSpot. So I think there's, there's kind of that arm of it. Uh, radio is always difficult because I don't know the last time any of us heard of a URL and went and typed it in, in Google. But there's, there's smart ways like, um, you know, sometimes we've done retargeting campaigns on a particular bus route or in an area where we know that people are hearing ads from a brand awareness campaign. And then we're trying to get smart with the online ads and the promotion and the retargeting we do that tie in with those offline campaigns. I think, again, with the pandemics, you know, we're not behind it, but certainly we're improving. Things like in Australia, we've got expos and conferences are, are kind of switching back on. So um, for us, we love that because, you know, yes, it's offline, you're face to face, but using tools, you know, like HubSpot through your mobile phone and forms on an iPad and a tablet and QR codes, we're definitely bridging that gap um, and moving more into offline to bring it online, if that makes sense. Yep, yep, yeah. yep. Off link. The biggest pain point of using offline channel is you can't attribute. It's Definitely. so difficult to do that attribution, right? One of the biggest things, I believe that this is one of the strongest reasons why brands have started investing more on the online front is for the fact that attribution is much easier. They can measure the success of any campaign and so accurately. So, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, uh, um, look at the, the HubSpot ecosystem definitely helps with attribution if it's set up properly. Um, yeah. And, you know, you've got things like UTM parameters you can program into a QR code that if, if a scan came from that QR code, it had to have come from that advert. So definitely yeah. there are ways we can, you know, we can do that today, which is awesome. But you're right. Uh, I think the Holy Grail is a 360 degree view of customer where we can, we can do all those reports. Um, but I think it's another reason why we kind of went with HubSpot that, from all the platforms we know, and some of them are gigantic, you know, Microsoft Dynamics, Salesforce, it's got some of the tools that just make that much easier. Yeah, gotcha. yeah. Uh, And Glenn, since you've been doing inbound marketing for so long now, please share a few useful tips of inbound strategies that uh, almost like every business can you know, go for. Yeah, so I think, the look, the biggest, oh, it's a tough question because it's quite broad, but I think, I think maybe the biggest advice I could give uh, some businesses force themselves into inbound. And what I mean by that is inbound is not for every business, you know, and there are some best fit criteria that don't apply to every business. And perhaps an example is a good way to go. If you're going to build a house, there's a whole lot of research you have to do. And in that research, uh, you know, inbound is all about an awareness, a consideration, a decision stage in the marketing function. Um, so I think I would generally say, and so, so that's the one step is, is the business conducive to inbound is the first advice I would give, you know, before you launch into full, full inbound methodology. And then secondly, inbound applies and, and HubSpot really works for business that has the need for a multi-channel environment. If you're just doing email marketing, or you just need a website, or you just need some social um, tracking and publishing, I, I would say HubSpot's not the best tool for you. Uh, out the box, their freemium and their startup packages would really allow any business to get started. But again, it's on the assumption that your business is a fit for inbound. And I, and I think probably the biggest advice I keep taking away from this, the messaging for today is ask yourself, how, how long is my purchase cycle? 
So for example, yeah. if like I said, you're building a house, someone who's going to build a house, uh, they're not going to do it tomorrow. They're not going to walk into a home building center and say, right, I want that house and I'll have it in six months time. They're researching for months and months. Good use case. Someone even who buys a motor car, uh, you know, some people just want to go test drive. I think very few with a high end car would just drive out of the showroom uh, that day. So again, a good use case. But then another good indicator of the opposite is like a low cost widget or, you know, something you'd buy on Amazon where you, you kind of, you look, you consider from impulse, you're ready to buy, not a good use case for inbound. So I can't tell you how many businesses just expect inbound to work for them. And sometimes it's a fault to HubSpot, you know, HubSpot have a team that do direct selling. Um, and we've inherited a few businesses that really should never have had inbound methodology in the first place. So I think from a consulting perspective, maybe also what sets Lupo Digital apart is we're not kind of HubSpot first. We look at the business and we, we're happy to say no. And probably, gosh, of the eight inquiries or 10 inquiries I speak to a day, maybe two are a fit and we'll take conversations forward and maybe eight we reject. And a lot of those eight will give them pointers like when is a good time to come back and talk to us? And honestly, in the last probably three or four years, I'm getting many repeat calls to say, look, you told me the time wasn't right. I went with another agency. I lost a couple thousand dollars and I didn't take your advice. And it's weird, but you know, I'm back and I want to have a chat. And I think that's, that's, that is also true to inbound that HubSpot as a business has a really honest culture code. I know I'm saying some of the sales team might sell the product hard, but yeah. I just think businesses should say, what is my purpose? What do I need to achieve? What am I, what do I have right now? And is this actually a good fit for inbound? And is it a good fit for HubSpot? And if they're not sure what that is, they should seek out the answers from whoever they're talking to. Like, just, just show me how this is going to work for my business before we jump in. Hook, line, and sinker. That's a very real trait, Glenn. I've seen like a lot of, especially agencies, they don't let go. People always have a hard time saying no to a inbound lead and an incoming business. Pretty surprised that you do that. <laughs> well, I was going to say, Dasha, like it's, it's, you know, I know you come from agency world and it's funny, my, my business partner and I, um, it, it wasn't always like that. You know, I, I mm -hmm. come from agency side. My business partner doesn't. He was client side, so we're a good fit. But through the years, we've had a lot of pain where he said, look, um, you know, we have very defined best fit criteria and I think we're kind of growing up. The more mature you get out there, you start to back yourself and you start to have some courage. So we didn't start our business that way. And when you start a business, you just need every lead. Yeah. Um, we have a, a good approach. Um, every 90 days, we kind of have a strategy offsite and we look at our business and we say, you know, who's our best fit? Who's our persona? And we really try to practice what we preach. Um, so I think you're hundred percent right, but he, him and I, through the years, I've said, you know what? I don't think that business is a fit. Um, you know, you'll be, you'll be the account manager once we onboard that and why don't you test it out and see, and we'll, we'll kind of reassess in three months time at our strategy offsite and just see how did we go. And so I think through a process, maybe that's the other thing I'd say is, you know, take time to step back to other agency owners and have the confidence to say like, because it's much harder and it's much more effort to nurture a bad customer. And that's when I say that, I, we don't want to believe it and when you take them on board, it's not their, when I say bad customer, it's not their intention. It's not our intention. But the truth is you have to work out what you do best on the planet as a business, right? And I think if the writing's on the wall, we as business owners have that gut feel, like this is a bit off. Like I'm going to take a chance. And I'd say don't take that chance because the time and effort on the, on the areas that you are weak and that you can't deliver, you're going to spend 80% of your time trying to pretend you do those things well. And it's much easier to actually say, hang on, I don't do them well. And if I just hunt for the food I know how to catch, I'm going to be a lot more full with what I catch. Um, and so again, I'd say like to anybody listening to this, I think if you do the hard yards and give it a try peel off, like the ones you think it's a bad gut feel, firstly, cement your best fit criteria. And then secondly, test it. And like you said, it's hard to get the leads. That word lead, if they're not a fit, they're not a lead. Right? They're just another <laughs> waste of time in your database. Uh, get rid of it. And the sooner you know how to make that decision, the quicker you're onto the next prospective best fit lead and the quicker you'll make the next phone call. That's very wise, actually, Glenn. When you're picky, you're making life better for other stakeholders of your business as well. Dealing with a client you can't do justice on every day is very tough. Retaining them and then that's again like you know, the whole uh, pain point. And yeah. you position your business as solving pain points, right? Not to gain pain points. So, uh, but it's everything. This. You're right. It's it's even like it's staff morale, and it's it's like you're saying. You know, it's like oh, there's another one. We we didn't we didn't make that work last time. Like 
Yeah. We're going to we're going to try again. But if it's the same, if you do, I think that some say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, and knowing there's a mistake and not fixing it. But uh, like I said, it didn't happen overnight. And if someone listening to this says, "Wow, I wish I could just do that tomorrow," hopefully some of these words um, can help, and some of the learnings you don't have to go through the hard yards. Take the advice and give it a go. Gotcha, gotcha. Glenn, I was fascinated by your website development idea altogether and your approach. Uh, please tell us a bit more about the growth-driven design approach yeah. that you have and how you go about that. Yeah. So again, um, I have to credit this to Luke Summerfield. Um, you know, he's kind of the father of growth-driven design, those terms at HubSpot. And I, if I understand correctly, Luke was actually, he's actually a HubSpot partner. That's where I first learned about the term. And it was through the HubSpot Academy courses because they've kind of pioneered this methodology. And I'd almost say like growth-driven design is probably inbound, but purest to a website and the whole idea is uh, we know as agency owners you, you're probably going to inherit your customer's website unless they're asking you to build it from the ground up and so the concept of growth driven design is twofold one is how do we optimize a website we inherit to improve it hmm. obviously based on inbound methodology but rather than uh, again a horrible term they kind of say chucking the baby out with the bathwater, right rather than chucking it away and starting it again the concept of growth-driven design is small incremental steps of optimization. Um, okay. So as we prove and as we apply an adjustment, we measure the outcome, we see it's working. It's a lead to doing more of that. While taking care of the optimization, like yeah. when coming up with the idea of optimization, which are the primary KPIs that you look into before taking that step? So it's a, look, it's a, again, it's a, it's a big question to answer because it depends on the nature of what we're trying to optimize you know if and, and again coming back to your question about growth driven design i'll just try to piece the two together that sure. if we inherit a client um and and so so there's there's three things you know if we're building a website from the ground up you can apply a growth driven design approach where you learn from the past and you optimize the current site to achieve a better website so in that example your kpr might be the site before got a thousand visits and we converted 20 people we make some optimization and rebuild the website with a new template, a new look and feel. I mean, you don't want to do the whole thing new, right? But you keep some of the elements, you change some elements. And let's say now the same thousand people next month, we're converting 40. And so from a growth-driven design perspective, it's, it's incremental changes. It's not overhauling the website. It's not actually doing a whole new template. You know, that might be something you want to do, but it's, it's more as you move down the page. And then a second example, just in terms of what other KPIs would be relevant. If we were looking at a website where traffic's coming from paid media campaigns, yeah. um, on the one hand, traffic could be coming to the business's homepage. They could have products they're promoting. So there's seven different product pages. And what we could do is a kind of hypothesis using, you know, heat mapping software and that kind of thing to say, how can we improve the design of this page to get a better outcome? And even with HubSpot, you can do A-B testing. So leave the old page the way it was, identify you know, five conversion optimization tactics to, to try the hypothesis with, build another version of the page that cuts out the bad stuff, puts in the new stuff. And through this process of growth-driven design, you're testing the hypothesis of what worked. And sometimes it's not just that page. There might be fundamentals on that page that could impact the entire website, like something like, there was no call to action button on any of the product pages. We tested on one. It's starting to work. We're getting more clicks. So let's move that, that idea across all the product pages and boom, we just quadrupled conversion rates. So the KPIs there might be, you know, traffic coming to the page, percentage of conversion. Um, but to be honest with you, you know, we weren't getting any video watches and now we're using an autoplay. People are automatically seeing the video and that's encouraging them to click a button under the video. So I think the metrics yeah. will be literal. We'll look at how many visits, how many clicks, how many hits. After we've done the kind of growth-driven design optimizations, we'll come back and look at those same metrics and see we're up, we're down, we're better, we're worse. The ones that are better gives us a sign. Keep doing that. And then, you know, we kind of sometimes even do it in phases. We're phase one. If phase one worked, let's move to phase two. If phase two worked, move to phase three. And the cumulative effect of all three is actually exponential. But I think, yeah. again, to summarize this concept of, of growth-driven design, it's, it's incremental design changes to lead yeah. to better growth that's going to start powering change versus turn off the old website, build a new one. But we actually haven't learned what on that old website didn't work. Gotcha. Gotcha. Just curious, Glenn, uh, do you do like with respect to email marketing, are you a fan of cold outreach email or not? 
Oh, look, um, I'm definitely not. When I look at my inbox and the sea of emails I'm getting now daily, I can't keep up with the unsubscribes and the opt-outs, let alone, is there something valuable there? Yeah. Yes, there's smart tools like blocking people that aren't in my contacts and that kind of thing. But running an agency, you won't get any leads if you do that. So it's a tricky one. And I think, again, when we recruit, I get so many emails about SEO and web developers and all the rest. But the short answer is no, I'm definitely not a fan. Gotcha, gotcha. And apart from Upspot, do you deal with other CRMs and marketing automation? Is this something that you consult to your clients or is it just limited to Upspot? Yeah, so again, just like I suppose just um, true to the core of what I've mentioned, like we implement Hubspot. So, but yep. we inherit and we integrate from other platforms. Uh, sometimes gotcha. those integrations mean other platforms actually running side by side. And so we've got quite an awesome diverse team where we understand those platforms and a lot of our team members sometimes have been selected or they come with that experience on these other platforms. So we know how to work in those platforms. And in fact, part of our training at Lupo, we, we're often recommending to the team to for your personal development. Don't tune out mm -hmm. of those old platforms you used to be a master in. Stay abreast of the cutting edge because we all know today HubSpot might be the flavor or Salesforce might be the flavor, but tomorrow there's a new kid on the block. So we've always got our feelers okay. open and, and we've got a diverse team. Uh, but to answer you, yeah, we, you know, when we're doing the work, we're doing the work in HubSpot. And, and like I said, there's a few businesses that they're on MailChimp, you know, they're running landing pages um, with HubSpot's form builder. There's a use case there to instead use HubSpot marketing emails and landing pages hand in hand and prove a case to actually start spending more, use HubSpot more. Uh, but we can integrate with the others. Um, yeah. But the thing is, like I say, because HubSpot's licensing, kind of the cost you're spending, you really want to use the tool. We, we try and encourage businesses, you know, there needs to be a crossover point where you let go of the old tech and you move into a better tech stack to get rid of all these extra payments every month. But it's a process. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, so I think, look, um, some awesome email products out there. Uh, email's an interesting one because somehow it still works. But like I say, even, even social and, and LinkedIn these days, the emails that are coming in and they're finding my email address from there. So they're just smashing me with emails. It's a problem. And I talk to more and more of the CEOs that are at, at our customers and everyone's complaining of the same thing. Marketing managers, sales directors, they're all complaining of this and service people that the forms are getting filled out. You know, we can optimize everything <laughs> through the contact forms. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Let's talk a bit more about your sales enablement process. Um, and if you can share a few tips on how to convert leads to the actual paying clients, uh, it will be brilliant, please. Look, I think if we're kind of talking sales enablement, my tip number one would be that I think anyone listening to this, if they're not doing it already, and again, I'm not sure if our audience is a bit more diverse to the business owners versus the actual agency owners, but even the agency owners, I think a quick win is, I'm still so surprised that when you hit a form on a website, um, which is really, it's a hand raiser. It's someone, someone who fills in a form. Yes, it could be service that they want, but this is my point. Immediately add some fields to qualify. Well, why is this person inquiring? And you might say, oh, that's so obvious, but um, I reckon if we Googled motor car and went to seven contact us pages on seven websites you probably just find its first name last name email phone none yeah. of them say you know what model are you interested in uh, what make are you interested in how did you get here so mm -hmm. the first thing i'd say is if you really want to enable the sales team and output quarterly leads from day one all those points on your website you know even not subscribe form because that's a bit different but if you've got like catch-all forms on the website or apply now or request a quote or free quote contact us a lot of businesses assume, oh, I got a sales qualified lead because someone filled in a form, but you know nothing about those people. So whether it's questions about persona, like who is it filling in the form? Questions about product, like what do you want from us? Because if they're filling in a form and they've already looked, uh, even little other things like not here for any of those, I, we've got that on our, we are constantly how many people are looking for a job or trying to solicit business to us actually do select, I'm not a customer, like I'm not looking for one of your products. And it allows us to actually pigeonhole them um, and, and in fact, we've hired, we've hired some of our team that way. So people saying, I'm looking for a job that come through the contact us form. And because we're filtering them, we're able to bank that. So there's opportunities that come out of it as well. But I think there's so much I could talk about, but if you're kind of saying, what's the value to our listener? What could I go away and do? Whether I'm an agency and advising my customers or I'm an end customer, um, that would be my, my number one tip. And I guess it dovetails any other tips, which is just look back at, you know, make sure you've got a pipeline. 
Make sure you understand the stages of your pipeline. As I said, we keep optimizing ours all the time. We've got it down pat. You know, we have a, a connect call. If the business has a pipeline, yeah. that it's possible to kind of continually optimize that. But yes. in our process, we, we kind of, we have a connect call to just find out if that business is a best fit. It's very short. It's very sharp. If they are, we then schedule more of an exploratory that again, allied to our clients' pain points, not what we want to sell them. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll kind of say, look, you are a fit for us and we think we can help you, but we've got a whole lot more questions just to understand, you know, not just your budget, your authority, your timing, but things like, let's just get straight to your pain points. Is there a list? What does it look like? Uh, yeah. We've got some questionnaires and things that we shoot out our prospects to fill in before we have that call. So we kind of see before we have that call where we should focus. Uh, yeah. Once we've had that call, we're pretty much good to know where we can help them and if we can help them. And um, generally, we'll move straight into proposal phase because our, our system allows us to lock in exactly what we need to do with them to get going. So as I said right at the beginning, whether that's consulting work uh, or it's product specific or it's HubSpot specific, from a sales enablement point of view, we've, we've set up a whole lot of forms and fields in our CRM in terms of the type of customers and the information we need at each step of that process uh, just to make it really short, sharp and aligned. And then, and then lastly, from a sales enablement point of view, we use that, like we practice what we preach in HubSpot. So we use the sales templates features, we use snippets uh, for quick recall. And it's also allowed us to scale quite quickly with our, with our BDMs and our reps and our sales team that we're all speaking with one voice and everything's tracked and it's trackable. So our playbook's really good. Um, but I think all of these words, I'm not trying to throw out the, fuzz, the fancy words, but I think if a business is thinking sales enablement, what do I do? Those are all the kind of things that you really need to get a handle on and start developing to make the team most efficient. Gotcha. Gotcha. Claire, I think we're coming to an end here. I would like to have a quick rapid fire with you. Are you ready for that? Shoot. Yeah. All yeah. right. What motivates you the most? Ooh, um, quick. Laugh. <laughs> At what age were you the happiest and why? Right now. 43. Because of the experience I have and my beautiful family. <laughs> uh, what career did you dream of having as a kid? Don't have a memory, but I'm where I am right now is where I need to be. <laughs> That's nice. One word that describes you the best. <laughs> um, fun, energetic. Yeah, nice. Two words. Nice. What is your next big goal in life? I want a farm, a digital farm. <laughs> So I've, I've got a dream and a passion to be able to extend a branch of our business to a rural farm in Australia and mm -hmm. uh, make a bit of an oasis where we can, we can bring less privileged people to learn, to upskill, kind of, the, you know, sales software service, every business needs it. Um, so I'd love to give back that way and cultivate culture where, you know, every three to five years, we're bringing people in that couldn't afford it or couldn't do it or wouldn't get an opportunity to be able to work and then place them into jobs. That's really my dream. And it's something I've had in my pipeline. Yeah. 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 Good luck for that. Thank you so much, Glenn, for all the time and all the wisdom, all the knowledge that you have shared with us today. Uh, it's so great to meet you. Thank you so much. You too, Harsha. Thanks for having me. And yeah, look forward to next time.